What's up, everybody? It's Todd, itinerant, the robe, and we're here with Nathan. Oh, Nathan, Wise Guy History. You got, you got it right there. Um, Nathan, Wise Guy History is a YouTube channel, and um, we're going to play a little GTS uh, live today. It's going to be a little bit of a learning session here. I've had a few people tr try to teach me, and Nathan will soon learn, like, okay, this is why he's on his, like, fifth teacher. Um, Nathan is uh, joining us from Australia. I'm from, Colin, uh, from St. Louis here. So we have a little fun live play action here. We've also got uh, Jen Chaos 33 join us. Uh, he's got a channel out there. He said he's got a couple videos and he even has a GTS video. And uh, so that's cool. So check out his channel. And then, of course, Nathan, you have a uh, YouTube channel, which is how I, I found you. And you've been doing a lot of GTS lately. So can you tell us, tell, tell them. Tell me a little bit about like your wargaming history and then your like a little bit about your channel. Yeah, I, I kind of see myself as a, a general gamer. I play lots of different Euro games and Mary Trash, um, but I've really been diving into GTS lately. It is such a deep, complex game. Um, and all these titles come with so many different scenarios that there is just a huge depth of playability in these boxes. So I've just been really focused mainly on The Greatest Day for nearly six months now, playing it constantly. Um, recently started playing Operation Mercury, um, diving back into No Question of Surrender and Where Eagles Dare a little, but just in each of these titles, there's, there's a lot of gaming available. Um, keeps me occupied. And where possible, I try to do sort of short videos of these scenarios to give people an idea of how they all play out. Um, because in, in, just in The Greatest Day, each scenario has a different feel to it. Um, You've got the, we were just talking before about the beach invasions where you're throwing everything at the beaches. This is a more open manoeuvre type situation. The Saga of the Six Airborne is almost like a siege situation. So, yeah, a lot of flexibility there. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I, I want to do that Saga of the Six at some point too. Well, I want to, want to try them all, of course. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Nathan's been doing a lot on The Greatest Day. And you said this in one of your videos, but you don't normally focus down in on a game like this, a system like this. Usually you kind of go back and forth to stuff. So um the depth has captured you i guess yeah yeah i mean i'm playing other stuff at the same time so i'm playing um nations in arms i've got set up behind me playing high frontier with friends we've got a game of twilight imperium 4 scheduled for this weekend oh, cool. but this is the one that is almost constantly set up um behind the scenes always going back to it yeah so i'm playing other stuff that i'm not always doing videos on but this gts just lends itself to great stories yeah. um and the tension, and uh, I guess just these, these narratives that come out of these areas is amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so everybody, go check out Nathan's channel. I mean, he did, I mean that's obviously something interesting to me about the way he does his videos. Are very, you tell a really good story, and you do a good job of talking about your decisions you're making and, and that. So it, 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 I don't know, it was really cool. And then another thing that kind of got my attention, so people should go check out, is Nathan did this really cool um, video You've done a couple like this where they're almost like just thoughts about gaming, right? It's not about a specific game. And like the one that really caught my attention was um, <clears throat> um, overcoming war gamers block or war gamers block. Mm -hmm. And basically it's about learning. How do you, how do you dive into like, a, especially GTS is a perfect example of that. Like it's pretty daunting. So to, can, and you say this in the video, but like, so how long did you take you to get great at day started playing or GTS? Yeah. So I've only been, I, I read the rules for, the GTS system about a year ago, and I set up the first scenario for the greatest day, the Black Baron, and it sat set up on my table for about four or five months. Uh, a lot happened in that time. I went overseas for a, a couple of weeks, um, but it just sat there and I was frozen, kind of in fear about this big game and this small scenario and kind of afraid to move the first counter. And I was saying earlier, it, it, it created a stain on my table where the sun had kind of bleached the, the table around when I moved the mat out of the way there was this kind of mats uh map shaped stain so yeah i wanted to kind of talk about this youtube can be a place for starting conversations as well and i thought i'd talk about wargamers block and that that moment where we get frozen and i yeah as i said it's basically in the video is the best thing to do is just start moving even if you make mistakes overcome that fear and just do it right i mean yeah so i i appreciate that because i definitely want to do that because i'm one of those people that want to get all the rules right and I've played ASL before, and I know that that's not even possible in that game. But it's even, you know, even a game like this, it's just really, even, gosh, almost every board game we play, you're probably not going to get a rule right, <laughs> even some of the more simpler ones. And yeah. just playing I'll, uh, Lock and Load this morning with Kev, there were things I know to do. And he goes, oh, you could have overrun this. And I'm like, totally, totally forgot about that. Just didn't yeah. even. 
So, yeah. It, uh, so I, I appreciate that. It's just kind of a nice thing to encourage and being reminded, like, oh yeah, just start moving crap around. And yeah. um, so I have done this. So just so everyone else knows, so I have done this a few times. I've so um, you've talked about Ty. Um, his videos have been helpful to you, and Lee Forster's videos. So if anyone's into wants to learn about GTS, there are some really good videos out there. I'd say Ty and Lee's are probably the top for GTS because they really mm -hmm. dive into how to play. And Ty is working on some, he's doing play testing for Utah and he's doing a, a write up of, of helping create um, a magazine like version, like almost like they did for OCS, where it'll be like, I think it's going to be a small game and then just like strategy articles and tips and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's pretty awesome. So I have a tie has sat down with myself and Mitch to teach us, uh, you know, Crete in person one time. And then I've had a couple and some other one teach me, you know, but this to me, especially diving in, you got to kind of get some, spend some time on it. Um, so we got some good people. Uh, well, everyone's good, but we got some people watching. We got Keith Talbot here. He says, hello all. Keith has been involved with, uh, I think Keith, yeah, your world at war, right? Way 85. We've got ASL in real time. Yeah, I get well, especially ASL, man. It's easy to get Wargamers block every time you play. Yeah, so, so ASL in real time, great, great videos, everybody. And seriously, they do. He started out doing the videos with so literally, they would just speed up the camera. So they'd film their whole game and then just speed it up almost like it's in real time. And that's that was pretty cool. And, but he's done some a lot of live plays now and also just some like reviews and stuff like that. And kind of I think some things we got Blast Pop, another good video channel. Hi, there is a difference between game, getting it wrong and not playing a game to its fullest in terms of tactics. Yeah. And this is still something I'm working on with GTS. So I know the rules, but you things like placing roadblocks. Um, placing rear guards, even something simple like building improved positions. You, you know the rules. It's knowing when to apply those rules to situations, which is which takes time. Uh, and again, I'm still developing that that understanding. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, gosh. The, so, like I said, even lock and load, which relatively speaking is an easy game compared to this. There's still stuff you can do that there's a lot of depth there to you know improve your gameplay and something like this a system like this holy cow <laughs> there's so many little working parts that i think there's a lot of replayability value like oh i didn't even think to do like you just yeah. said. um let's see we got modeling for advantage this channel is one uh, i really like this is their miniatures but they do a really good job of introducing people to games and stuff that i, I did did a little uh thing for them i it, Hopefully they like it and they're going to put it on their channel. So they're cool. Uh, well, they, yeah, so they're cool because they're putting me up. That's not it. Mad Dog 67, what's up? Oh, we got some 11, 10 people watching us right now. Um, yeah, yeah, players at Con Sim World, they like this one. And then uh, ASN Real Time. Yeah, thanks. We stumble our way through things, don't we all? So, all right. So the uh, everybody with the scenario plan, Nathan, again, thanks for coming on. This is great. And uh, hopefully everyone gets a little bit as uh, while I'm learning and Actually, Nathan's still learning and stuff, and it's different when you start playing it with somebody too, right? Have you played this face-to-face uh, -face or anything with anybody? No, I was just thinking about this this morning. Um, friends and I often share photos of the games, the scenarios we're playing, uh, uh, but I've only ever played solo. Oh, wow. Wow. No. <laughs> this will be interesting. It yeah. is. I do a lot of solo too, and it's like when I was playing with Kev, I was like, I really need to play more play face-to-face because -face – now, in this case, you're going to know the rules better than I do, but you just kind of can check each other on rules and also help each other remember things. And especially a game like this, it's really hard to be like hyper competitive with it. Like you kind of just help each other play. At least that's how I approach it. Um, and last one. Oh, cool. So go check out Modeling for Advantage. You'll see a little intro by me on there. That's pretty cool. All right. So let's get the screen up here. You're going to uh, we'll share the screen with the, and then you're, well, then I'll get rid of our beautiful faces and you can, guys will just be able to see the screen. So we're playing the uh, to the sea scenario. I'm not going to read you the entire uh, thing about it, but it is. Oh wow! It is only a. It's only a two hour. Is this a one turn game? Two uh, hours should end on the second. It gets two turns. Yeah. Oh yeah. Seventeen hundred and nineteen hundred hour. So oh, I see. It's going to be two turns. So okay. Yeah. So um, can you with these introductory scenarios, for anyone sort of looking at this, um, these aren't big scenarios. They're not designed to be perfectly balanced. You're only drawing a few chits out of the cup. Um, but really, it, it's it's introducing the rules gradually and introducing some of the concepts. So this one has a lot of roads. Uh, it's kind of a meeting engagement scenario. 
So this, yeah. Yeah. So GTS, well, first of all, I should say, gosh, they might be out by now. I don't know. So if you're interested at all in grand tactical series, as you watch us and, and don't, don't let my play uh, confuse you, but if you like what you see here, MMP, the publisher of this just put on sale. And I don't know if it's still going on. I think it probably is. Yep. We're selling their Crete game, Operation Mercury for $40. I think it's a, what does it retail for? Like one something? 150? Yeah, normally 170. Yeah, $170 for $40. I mean, they usually you don't pay retail for that if you're buying from a store or something, but $40, dude, you can't find that used. And this is a brand new copy. Now, for people like Nathan uh, in the hinterlands or anybody, I, I think Europe's the same way. The, the shipping is crazy. But yeah, seriously. Yeah, keep it yeah, MMP have defended themselves. They've, they've said they're just charging um, what it actually costs them to ship. Uh, it is a bit expensive, but this is just a reflection of actual shipping costs. They don't charge any handling fees. For yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the case. But still, it's still a really good price. And I don't know, maybe, I don't know, if you can find somebody that can help you ship it cheaper or, I don't know, join on somebody. But the point is, it's a real super good price. So if you're in America, it's going to be 40 bucks plus $15 shipping. It's an incredible price. Um, but they all, even Crete, they got a lot of intro scenarios. So if you look at the back of the book, oh, yeah, you can't really, I'm not going to ask you the first detail. But all those little things are all the scenarios they have. So there's seven introduction scenarios, five, six intermediates, and three advanced. And I think that they don't even say the whole scen So there's probably actually another advanced, which is the whole thing. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, so that's pretty cool. And the, yeah, and this and yeah, and like you said, they just introduced concepts. So it's not necessarily meant to be like a good gaming experience or like, you know, but it's going to teach you a lot of the little routines and things. So anyway, yeah, that's good to see. Yeah. And it's basically the 21st Panzer Division trying to, you know, push the Commonwealth, you know, to the sea. Yeah. And I think this is when. Um, Okay. Well, anyway, so we're not going to go into all the details about all that. And this isn't really necessarily meant to be a perfect uh, training video, but just Nathan kind of walking through and and uh, doing all that. So now let's get rid of Nathan and I and get to the important stuff here. And this Vassal module is incredible. It's one of the better. ASL is a great module. This is also a very good Vassal module, as you'll see as we click around and do stuff. Oh, I'm playing the Germans. And uh, Nathan, and I'll, I will zoom in uh, occasionally here so you guys can actually see. I don't know if I can just do that now because the, the maps and the historic. I just watched a video by Ty why he liked the Where Eagles Dare, which is another game in the system on um, uh, Market Garden, and just the details. So you can read a history book, and then you'll see the details. I mean, you can see how far down the, the, the pictures go, and you can read about these towns and win 24 and, and there it is and so much is represented here um so yeah we'll get to learn about all kinds of stuff so anywho we got some step losses already revealed all right cool now there's a lot of things going on in this game so there's the turn track there Thing we really need to worry about that, except for we can look at um, whether it looks like it's overcast. Time is 1700 and it's the 6th of June. Anything we need to do with the turn record chart right now? I don't think so, right? No, that's all pretty, pretty stand. Yeah, pretty static. Um, two turns, weather remains the same. I don't think there's any air support in this scenario. Let me allied re reinforcements, markers. Um, Yeah, I don't think the allies have any air. Reading through the scenarios, special rules, yeah. Um, there are several warships. We've got the Rodney Roberts War Spite in the long range box. We have the Danae Dragon Frobisher Scylla in the medium range box. We have 3DD Flotilla. So, and this is cool. I just saw this watching one of Lee's videos because I, I do had, well, if you watch my channel, I, I went through a little bit on a, 
one of the beach landing ones. And that's when I realized like, doggone, I just got it. I'm being impatient. But I did notice that you can right click on this ship over here and say which one you want to attack with. Yeah, yeah. And you click on it and it'll tell you. So that was pretty awesome. Like, whoa, that would have saved me a ton of time because I was going. Because you can also go here and say attack, find your target, blah, blah, blah. And it works. But that's, that's other ways way faster. And it's the same with units as well. In this in this vessel mod, if you right click on a unit, you go to combat and then attack, it brings up a little sort of indicator, and you point that indicator at the unit you want to attack, and it kind of indi it highlights uh, obstacles in the way, terrain that blocks line of sight, uh, the range. When you click then on your target, uh, it brings up sort of a fire chart which shows all the modifiers that apply, including the defense terrain. The unit's defense rating, uh, range modifiers, all it, it calculates all these things for you. So this vassal mode is great for learning uh, the game. Yeah. So like right here, I'm looking at uh, range nine. So it tells you the range as well. Because and then, but it's showing that it's blocked. Well, uh, it's either blocked or yeah. You can see the the the, the town hex there that is surrounded in red that blocks line of sight. Yep. Uh, so it highlights that. If you try to cross a ridge or, or two crests, it'll highlight those in yellow. Uh, the crests are further below. You can see the the, the, the hedgerows are blocked there. They're red. Um, the ridges down below. See, it highlights that ridge in yellow when you try to cross the line of sight there. So it highlights, it just highlights these. Again, you can um, fire across a ridge if the target is directly adjacent to it. Yeah. Uh, you can oh. shoot. Yeah. So does that mean... No, it's, well, we won't worry about that because we're going to come across it in real life. So, yeah, yeah it's a really cool module. Um, I don't know what I did to get rid of the attack uh, thing there, but uh, all right, there we go. All right, perfect. Um, I think there was one chart that I wish I had. And I'll have to download that another time. Really good thing about direct commands. All right, so let's. Um, Anything else we need to kind of understand as we're kind of looking at a scenario here? Now, another cool thing is that it's all set up for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess the, the setting here is this is the afternoon of the 6th of June. Um, British have landed. Uh, Canadians just out to their left. And this is around the time the 21st Panzer Division is counterattacking between those two landing beaches. So just on the left of this map here, La Deliverande, just to the left there is the off map is the Duvra... Uh, radar defense installation, which held out for several days. Uh, you've got Pegasus Beach out, uh, Pe Pegasus Beach, Pegasus Bridge out on the right. Um, and so the 21st Panzer historically drove through that road on the left and reached Lyon sur Mer on the beach. Uh, this scenario gives the Germans a few options. They don't necessarily have to do that. They uh, select. Secret, secretly select a task, either interdict that road along the beach near Lyon sur Mer, that red road. They can try to take and hold Pegasus Bridge, or they can try to retain control of Strong Point Hillman, which is uh, sort of in the middle, surrounded by those minefields. Uh, it's a hard one for them to do because they can't, they don't really have much control over what the Allies do. Um, that's around, what heck is that? It's about 30. 7, 6, 35, 15, I think. Yep. So the German, the German player picks one of those objectives and then keeps it secret. And then they reveal their objective at the start of the second turn. Uh, Only the German player has a, a, an objective in this scenario. The, the allies are trying to figure out what they're trying to do and prevent them from doing it. <laughs> and so there's the, so I can go for that. That I got highlighted there on the screen, or I can go for is this Pegasus Ridge down here. Yep. Uh, or the beach. Now, if you look out on the left, that 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 road to the beach is wide open, and in fact, you can reach that with some of your um, some of your tracked units. One of your at least one of your tracked units on the first activation. Uh, you've got some strong points down on the beach, and they can follow this road if they're careful. They can follow this road out on the left through Vitus and Nest 22, through Luke Semer, and reach that road on their first activation. And these are um, along the coast here, these are city hexes. They are great for defense. They provide, uh, what is it, a negative two, negative three modifier for unarmored targets, negative two for armored targets. Keeping in mind, though, 
suggests that armored units in city hexes must stay, I think they must stay in column. Um, and column, units in column uh, effectively have no beneficial defense modifiers. So it's not great for them to kind of, for these armored units to sit in the city, but if they can kind of sit nearby and kind of defend the allies as they try to advance. Okay. So that, that's, I, I kind of, I think that's the more achievable objective. I think strong point Hillman is kind of out of your hands. It depends what the allies do. And Pegasus Bridge is, uh, it, 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 it's almost like a siege here. They're, these are entrenched allied units around Pegasus Bridge. Units in entrenchments have a minus two armor rating, which is beneficial to the defender. They have a plus one uh, fire rating, plus one assault rating, plus two troop quality rating. There are minefields throughout this area. Uh, the terrain is also sort of town and village in this area, so that's additional defense modifiers. It's a tough nut to crack. Uh, you've only got two turns. Um, so, I mean, if you want to try that, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you haven't sold me on it. Um, no, yeah, I, uh, and keep in mind, you've got two German Kampgriffs. You've got um, Kampgriff Appel with the yellow band in the bottom right, uh, and I think they have some reinforcements arriving. And then you've got the stronger Kampgriff, I think it's Rorsch, Kampgriff Rorsch. Uh, they're the red banded units. And you've got all these black and white banded independent units, and they can be attached to these leaders. Uh, so your first leader is in the center there under those contact markers. Uh, your second leader is just below that in the yellow. And and they'll have their formation activation uh, chits. Uh, yeah, so a lot of flexibility for the Germans. Okay. Um... What does that say there? I need to zoom in a little bit. Choose one of these three for first, place the other two in the mug. So yeah. I guess I get to choose my... So if you click on the mug up the top, yeah, yep, yep. So you've got... Um, so German Direct Command, when you draw the Direct Command, for those watching, you can activate your non-independent units by spending command points. Uh, now, how many command points do the Germans have? 12, uh, 21st Panzer. No, this isn't the command points, I don't think. Troop quality. Oh, this is all troop quality. Hmm. Uh, here we go. Let's see. One, two, three, little symbol. Uh, so they've got, they've got 12 command points at the start. So they've got a few command points up their sleeves. Um, keeping in mind, you can't activate those really strong, I think they're pans of four units in the center. It has to be colored with these direct commands. They have to be the color banded units, non-independent units. Okay. Where, where were you seeing the... Hmm. Just to the left of Beville sur Orne are your kind of really strong units. They've, they've got a black band. Around hex 41, 0, 2, 2, and 0, 2, 3. Yeah, right there. Uh, down, down a bit. Yep. I think you've got one. So these yeah. are independent. Uh... They're kind of your big, I think they're pans. I mean, they're, they're kind of, I don't know what the Germans call them, the German tank squadrons uh, or companies. Uh, okay. But six troop quality. Uh, and keeping in mind, I think the, the highest troop quality I've seen is a seven. So these are high troop quality. Six firepower is also very high, and they have a great, a decent assault rating of four. They have a range of three, shown to the, to the top uh, right of that firepower rating. The um, the color of the firepower rating. So see the number six on the left in that white box. That's this means it's a dual purpose gun, and this is uh, hard hitting. If you look at the combat results table, there are a lot of step loss results on that table. If, you're, if you roll a zero on an unarmored target with a dual purpose gun, it's an instant step loss. Uh, so, yeah, this is some of the most effective firepower in the game. Yeah, those are pretty good. Um, 
one thing they do need to uh, be mindful of these armored units is I don't think that they, they can't cross ridges unless they're following the road. So that um, that first Panzer twenty two unit there, they're kind of surrounded by ridges. I think they need to kind of, I mean, they can hold their position there and defend. They're in a good defensive position, uh, but they can't move sort of northeast, north, northwest. They need to, if they want to move away from there, they need to back down quite a long way away from that ridge, I think. Yeah, I mean, so like this 22 here, the one in 41022. Yeah, he can move, he can move north, northwest. Can't oh, he, move can he can get to that road and then go up. Yeah, so tracked units can't are not permitted to cross a ridge, regardless of whether they're in column or not. Okay, so let's understand what the so what are the brown lines here? Yeah, oh, sorry. So they're, they're the ridges. The brown lines are ridges. These think of these as um, quite uh, rugged uh, points of terrain. There's, there's no there aren't elevation changes in GTS. Instead, the ridges and the crests represent kind of peaks of hills. So the ridges are kind of a, a a steep crest that tank armored units can't cross. The crests, think of these as more a mild hill that block line of sight. So a unit can um, can sit next to a, a crest or a ridge and fire over that crest or ridge. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, line of sight only extends um, basically across one crest line and only if it's adjacent to either the, the firer or the target. Um, yeah, the, the line of sight rules in GTS aren't complicated, but crests and ridge are probably the, the, the one things that just make it a little bit complicated. Um, so can he see him right there? He's on the edge. He's I, I've got this little drawn out thing here. Yeah, so see that's it's crossing one crest and ridge. One ridge, and that's OK. Okay. Um, I think this is one thing that I asked a couple of weeks ago. Can a line of sight cross a crest and a ridge? And I think it can. It can't cross two crests. It can't cross two ridges. Line of sight can't cross a crest that is not adjacent to the fire or the target. Um, but something like that should be okay. Okay. All right. Um, oh, here's my... Let's pull this over here so people can see this. And so this is my, this is kind of the, the things to know here. So there's the command, command and uh, dispatch points, but we probably don't have dispatch points in this, I guess. Hmm, probably not. Um, you got 10 commands. That's good. Um, we skip steps A to D of the sequence of play. Um, Command values, uh, yeah, command rating of, you've got a command rating of five and three, oh, sorry, I have a command rating of five and three command points. You have command rating of 10 and 12 command points. Yeah, dispatch points aren't used. Normally you'd use dispatch points to place uh, formation activation counters in the cup. But in this scenario, I think we just place them yeah. all, up. Yeah, all to place uh, in the mug each turn and they played through until the end, until the cup is empty. Gotcha. Dispatch points are not used in the mug can attempt surge. Okay. All right. So no dispatch points. So this is, I think, one of the things I kind of stumble on here a little bit is command and dispatch. And I always think of command as more tactical level spending and dispatch as higher level spending. Is that? Yeah. You, you're spending you're spending dispatch points to – dispatch points – command and dispatch is one of the most important aspects of the game. It is kind of your um, – yeah, your higher level um, ordering entire formations. You can spend two dispatch points to place, normally in a normal scenario, to place a formation activation counter into the cup. And when that chit is drawn, it enables the entire formation to activate. They can, most importantly, they can fire in their first action of a formation activation uh, and they get two, uh, two actions basically. Without that formation activation, they normally won't be able to fire during a turn unless you're spending command points on them. So by spending those two dispatch points early in a turn, placing that formation activation in a cup, you're getting a lot of firepower from your, your formations or your, your camp groups. 
Command is can be used to buy dispatch points. You can spend, I think it's two command points to buy one dispatch point, and you can spend this several times. Uh, but most importantly, they provide you with some sort of tactical, tactical flexibility. So you can spend command points to have units uh, activate during the direct command ship, or to conduct a second activation during their divisional activation. So when the divisional command ship is drawn, all units can activate, but they're limited in what they can do. You can then spend these command points to have them do a second uh, activation. But command points are hard to come by. <laughs> They're easy to spend, but you only accrue these once during a turn, and that's when your division command, uh, your division activation chip is drawn. When that happens, you make a die roll, you halve that die and add your command rating, and then you add that result to your command points. So it will vary from, if you're the German player, what was your command again, 10. Each turn, you'll get between 10 and 14 command points. I have a command rating of five, so I'll get between five and nine command points. Okay. But you gotta be careful with it. It is so easy to suspend these command points without thinking about it. Um, so th think of these as, yeah, very precious points. That you yeah, want to. And, that, yeah, and I mean, I guess this, this game kind of, this particular scenario kind of, Kind of throws it a little bit weird because you know you only got two turns. Um, yeah. And I've got a haul, whatever, to get up there. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So let's uh, put one of my. So it's yeah. to me. I, I wouldn't recommend the direct command. Um, I'd go with one of your formation. Because that costs and, a lot more command points, right? Yeah. And you have a lot more, at present, you have a lot more Camp Group Rorsch units on the board compared to your Camp Group Appellum units. So. My, I mean, do do as you like. My advice would be to place the current group Frosch units. Um, well, having said that, look, you might want to, I mean, you might want to bluff with Camp Group Appel and say, hey, I'm going for Pegasus Bridge and start moving all these yellow units to the right. And then Camp Group Rorsch might be drawn later during the turn, well, it will be drawn later during the turn. And that'll give you some time to think about how I'm responding. Right, so or, yeah, there's a few choices here. And, and, Again, this is part of the kind of broader tactical considerations you're making. Do you want to go straight ahead with yellow uh, or do you want to drive straight to the beach with red immediately? When I played through this, I picked the uh, Camp Group Rorsch red activation. I activated them immediately and a lot of these units drove straight towards, um, what's that place on the beach called? Luc Semer. Okay. Well, uh, and then I guess there's something else to take into account. I'm getting some reinforcements. Yeah, so they will activate, they will come in when, I think, when your division activation uh, comes out, uh, place reinforcements. When your divisions, uh, where is it? When a division activation chip is pulled, place their reinforcements. So you'll have to wait for them. They'll, they'll come out sometime during this turn. Okay. Now, keep in mind with a lot of your German units as well, your infantry in particular, um, if you have a look at your infantry out sort of uh, near around 42019, um, they only have below the six. The six is their troop quality rating, which is decent. Below that, they only have a movement value of four. But they are motorized infantry. Yeah. What did I just do? I just did something. Trying to, uh, oh, it's all mechanized. So you, you uh, how do you flip them over? I'm pretty sure they have, I thought they were mounted. Yeah, mount and yeah. control U on that one so I can go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So they're mounted. And on their mounted side, um, they have a far greater movement range. 23. Yeah. Yeah. Keep in mind, though, that they are pretty close to my infantry. <laughs> They've got a, uh, my, is it a Firefly squadron just to the right there? They don't have line of sight to you because you can't draw line of sight along crest or ridge lines. Um, and at present, they're in a decent position blocking that road towards Matthew. Uh, you've also got your vulnerable mortars just south of them. They have a defense rating of plus one, which is bad. Defenders want a negative defense rating. It subtracts from the attacker's fire. So these green mortar units just below with the green firepower rating, that plus one in that little box in the bottom left means that they're quite vulnerable to attacks. Uh, 
And at present, they're kind of in the firing line of that um, that armored squadron just to the top right. That armored squadron there can see the mortars. That more that uh, B staff's yeomanry can cross can see across that ridge line because they're right next to it. Uh, you can cross line of sight can cross a ridge if the firing unit is adjacent, and they can at present target your mortar. And at present, they do a lot of damage to your mortars. I, I'd imagine. Well, they'd have a good chance of scoring a hit. I'll say that. All right. So these the uh, reinforcements come out when? Sorry, when I pull uh, during the during the division activation chip. So they'll stay there for now. When you draw your division activation, the twenty first Panzer division activation chip from the cup, they come onto the board. Um, yeah. So that all happens. Uh... Yeah. So you'll um, you'll pick one chip. You'll place the other two chips back in the mug. The one chip that you selected will be the first one in play. We'll place that in the U in the uh, current uh, little box on the left. And then um, once you've done with that, we move it over to the U's and we keep drawing these activation chips until they're all drawn from the cup and the cup's empty. Hmm, interesting. I can't see how I put the yellow one like I did the other one into the mug. Oh, uh, if you just drag it to the mug. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right, so you're picking current group for all. Should I draw, drag that over to current? Um, and it's your... See how all your eligible units are now highlighted in yellow? This is a great thing about the the, uh, the Vassal mod. Um, it shows you. Now, keep in mind uh, that your leader... Where is he? He's under that contact marker. Uh, he has an activation range of 10. He has an activation rating of 7. Can you see where he is? Right in the centre of the map there, under those... Um, yeah. This means he can activate 7 or attach 7 independent units to his formation, uh, provided they're within a range of 10. The black banded heavily armoured units to the left there don't count against that rating. Uh, so you've got sufficient activation rating to activate pretty much all these units on the board. Yeah. Oh, there. I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong guy, but still. Yeah. yeah. What's, yeah. The, what's the five there? The five? Uh, command uh, rate? Good question. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a command rating. I'm not sure. Activate independence, non-eligible, information. Activations left. He has five activations left. So he's attached. He's got two. Oh, it's oh. Uh, this could be. Oh, so he's got two artillery units attached to him. Uh, yeah. They're the two spotted counters. So there's off oh. map artillery. He can attach five additional units to his command. Um, yeah. Another another cool thing. And uh, Jin Chaos is reminding us that Vassal sometimes does get it wrong, and you miss a unit or. Calculate yeah. perfect, so don't, uh, don't use, use it as a support, not as a whatever. Um, so I know you can also, uh, do, do, do. Hmm. okay, yeah, you can command range and see how yeah, far well, <laughs> that's great. So, yeah, any units in that range can be activated with that leader. Now, leaders can't move freely by themselves. They get a, they can move, the rules are a bit tricky here, they can move if you spend a command point to move a unit or they can freely relocate to another unit of their command at the end of the formation activation. Um, and this is another uh, careful kind of tactical consideration. Where do you want to place your leader? Um, when do you want to move your leader and where do you want to move them to? Because that, that I mean, in this scenario, the 10 activation range is huge. Um, but keep in mind, if you move your leader out to the left towards Matthew, the, that sort of lightly armoured recon unit out on the right near Pegasus Bridge will likely become out of command. Now, being out of command isn't much of an issue. It means that those units that are out of command can't spend command points for a second activation. Uh, it means they can't spend command points pretty much for any purpose. But they can still defend, they can still hold their ground. Uh, sometimes they can still move around. Just keep in mind, they they, they lose their flexibility. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I kind of, 
I'm kind of already written him off just looking at the map in the very first. Yeah. Time. Sorry, uh, guys. He's an armored unit um, in a town. So he gets a, a, a minus one armor bonus, which is okay, but he's, he's armored. Um, look, the airborne might struggle to, to deal with him because he's an armored unit. I'll probably have to gradually build up these suppression hits. He's got a good trip quality rating of six. He might he might last the scenario. So um, you've you've selected the red formation activation. You've got all these yellow units available. Keeping in mind, units have two movement states. They've got their regular movement, and then they've got column movement. Now, if you place, it costs one movement point to uh, place a unit in column. And this enables them mainly to take advantage of uh, cheaper unit, uh, movement costs when moving through terrain, roads in particular. So looking at the terrain effects chart, if a, uh, a leg unit, like an infantry unit, tries to move along a road or a railroad, the movement cost of moving along a road is half if they're in column. Uh, if they're not in column, it costs the normal movement costs for moving through that terrain. So throughout the GTS series, roads, and sort of the, the road networks uh, should be your sort of primary point of consideration. You're trying to clear these roads. You're trying to kind of move your armored units rapidly across the map. If you can clear these roads, some of these units can move from one end of the map to the other quite quickly. The idea for the defender or your opponent is to then block these roads by occupying key crossroads, um, by setting up roadblocks and rear guards. Um, and as a result, a lot of the fighting throughout these scenarios tends to happen around these the, the nexuses in these road networks, areas that can stop these armoured units from moving rapidly. And this scenario, as I said, is kind of kind of teaches that lesson by having this big open road out to the left of the allied positions um, and having that strong point hillman blocking some roads in the centre. So both, both sides kind of experience the the pros and cons of this road network. Yeah, look, it appears your um, your your boys are kind of surrounding my leader here. Yeah, well, one, um, yeah, keep in mind, leaders don't die. So your leader will never die. If the unit they're with dies, they just relocate somewhere else in this, in, in uh, the greatest day. When, okay, so what's the order of things that happen here? So if I want to, do I want to, Shoot some yeah. artillery first and move, or does it have to? Ha what, how does it all happen here? Yeah, look, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, it's always I I think it's always good to um, fire your artillery first to place uh, attempt to place barrage markers on enemy units that can potentially disrupt your movement plans. So, for example, um, I mentioned this mortar out here on forty two twenty, and how they're currently in the line of sight of that B Staff's Yeomanry unit. There's also an AT gun in that stack at 40.019. My thinking is that makes this hex a good hex to target with uh, artillery. There's also 38.022. Um, this is another good hex to target with artillery because you've got, again, that, uh, that heavily armoured unit, firepower of seven, range of four. Um, I suggest those two. There's also this one here at 39020. In, in effect, targeting those ranged enemy units that can potentially fire, opportunity fire on you. So whenever you move a friendly unit uh, within the line of sight of an enemy unit uh, in range, that enemy unit can potentially opportunity fire. And those allied armoured units have, have a range of four and a troop quality of six, which is, is pretty decent. So they'll be rolling for opportunity fire every time you attempt to move in their line of sight. Now you can basically block their line of sight by placing a barrage marker on them. So regardless of whether or not your artillery hits, provided you don't roll a nine, you'll place a barrage marker and blind their line of sight. That reduces their line of their um yeah, their, their line of sight to one hex uh, and gives you a lot more freedom of movement. And this is a this is a key kind of tactical consideration, blinding your opponent with barrage. You can also place smoke. So you don't always, you, you can target a, a, an empty hex, for example, 41019 um, to block that line of sight if you want. I think you're better off targeting the actual hex, but yeah, you can put empty hexes for artillery as well. Nice. And these barrage markers block line of sight. Okay. So the other, 
Well, I'm going to attach my units, the independence, before I do anything else. Yeah, yeah. You've got so you've got two artillery units. You've got the uh, was it the fourth, fifth Panzer artillery and the first Panzer artillery. They're they're off map in one of these boxes. Uh, yep. The scenario cards. Uh, it shows that. So I got the artillery part pulled up here. Yeah. I can only see one artillery unit, though. I don't know where the other one is. Where's the first? See, so I can see the the four fifth there. Um, four fifth, the Gwitter C, Gwitter. And the two yeah. artillery. Oh, you're not seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, I can see that, but where's the first one slash S? There should be another black artillery unit, one slash S. Maybe it's a reinforcement. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, one Panzer Art 155, is that the one? Yeah, it comes on. You've got some artillery coming on um, as reinforcements. Okay. All right, well, so just to help me kind of walk through this. So we've, we've yeah. pulled, I'm air quoting here, a division command shit, right? That's what no, they're... you've been called a formation oh, activation. Formation. Yeah, this is, this allows you to activate all units of that formation. Ooh, okay. So this is not division. This is formation. This is the, uh, yeah, this is, this is better. So all units become active. Um, they get their first action for free, and they can do any of pretty much any action they want. They can do engineering actions on the first turn. They can do fire actions on the first turn. So you can fire with your, your artillery. You can fire with your mortars. Good to start with those. Uh, then you can um, you can move with the rest of your units. Those units that fire. So you could fire, for example, with your mortar for their first action, and then each unit that activates. You can you have the option of spending a command point to take a second action. Now you're slightly more restricted in these second actions. You can't do engineering actions for your second action, but yeah, not so much of an issue in this scenario. Back, Nathan. Yeah, you still got me. I still got you. It doesn't look like it's wanting to share the screen anymore. I had this with Kev's thing too. I don't know if it's going on on my end or what, but. All right. So I'm gonna keep going. We'll keep plugging along here. Yeah, so let's have a go with firing with your artillery first because it's, it's a good start. You've got, um, keep in mind, you've got your off map artillery, which is based in an artillery park. Then you've got your on map um, mortars. And way down in 45027, you've got this organic artillery. And these are very flexible uh, units. They. Where is that again? Uh, 45027. Cool. See the brown, brown fire rating? Yep. This wow. means it's organic, and it can either do a direct fire attack within four hexes or a ranged indirect fire attack. Uh, in, this, in this case, up to 17 hexes away. They just need a friendly unit from their formation to spot. Uh, that basically means there's a friendly unit with a red band that can see their target. And when do I need to bring in the reinforcements? Any time? Uh, they, no, they come in with the divisional activation okay. chip. Which yeah. 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 So I have to use that, so, okay, cool. Um, yeah, wow. I, yeah, just keep keeping track of what you've shot and not shot. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, hopefully the mod will keep track of all these things. So when you activate your off-map artillery, so let's give this a go. Open up your um, – oh, you got that open? So right-click on your artillery, and let's see if it uh, can, you can fire with it. So the one, the black one on the right, yep. Can you combat with him? I can activate it. So combat. Combat. Uh, is there an attack? If you scroll down a bit, is there an attack – option it's not it's not highlighted there is one there but it's grayed out so do i need to probably do something with my okay oh if you click on the sorry the in contact marker on the map so okay. don't worry about the map on the map the four fifth panzer artillery right click on that one and attack with him 
yeah. Now it'll show you sort of uh, what. Oh, okay. it's going from the park. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So you don't need to worry about line of sight. This is indirect fire. You just need a friendly unit from the formation spotting. So anything you can see. So you can't uh, you can't target those units way down the beach. You're obviously you know looking. You've got a spotter from the formation, um, and you can yeah pick any of my uh, units to target that you can see. And it's the the in contact guy who can see them, right? It's the yeah, yeah. So it should tell you in most cases. Um, you can see him. He can be seen from the top left. So am I going to have two? Oh, that's the other artillery you're looking for. Okay, so hmm. so you'll, you'll have one artillery, one off map artillery. You'll then have the option of the organic artillery. You'll then have the option of your on map mortar uh, units as well. I can see one, two mortar units in the map. Okay. So you'll, you'll potentially have up to four units firing indirect fire. Okay. I think I either want to go with this guy or. But I can't see him from that. You can, yep. So the your mortar unit is just to the two hexes away, and the, the green unit to the southwest. He can see him. He can see him across the ridge. Right, but who's That's right now? I'm using my um, off board artillery, right? So yeah. Well, this is um. If uh, yeah, keep in mind if you with uh, indirect fire, if you hit cause any type of hit on a unit in a hex, all other units in that hex suffer a possible suppression result as well. So this is um, kind of the effect of explosive, high explosive fire on a densely packed hex is that whilst you're maybe targeting the armoured units, all other units can potentially suffer hits as well. Yeah. Okay, so in, so I'm right now I'm using my offboard artillery and I'm, I think it's kind of interesting that it draws the, the sight range from the artillery park. I guess it's telling me the range. I guess it needs to tell yeah, me Yeah, maybe the range, yep. But it doesn't really help me know who that, what, what that hex can see, right? I assume that's where it's spotting from, or is that not really yeah. how that works? Um, I don't know. Yeah, the, the artillery parks are mainly just an indicator of range. Um, it's where your artillery is actually placed, but they so, don't need to spot. They don't need to spot from there. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, uh, they're relying on sort of radio contact with the units of their formation to spot for them. So, I've got so the idea, the idea of these artillery parks is you set these artillery parks up. 10, 15 hexes behind the front lines, away from the enemy. You drive your artillery to these parks, they park there, unlimber, and then they can fire away in safety from range, relying on um, their comrades to kind of spot for them, radioing in sort of targets. Um, yeah, so I don't think I'm worried too much about people up there. I'm kind of worried more about the people right here. Yeah. I think I'll just blast this guy that's right next to me. Yeah, cool. So, so I'll click on that. Should bring up the fire chart. All right, and this is uh, something else that uh, Jim yeah. Cass is saying to just kind of check the numbers on. So I'm going to look yes. at my combat results thing just to kind of learn the numbers here. Yeah, so you've uh, this is the first thing to keep in mind. This is a, an orange fire rating, so it's indirect fire. This is uh, most artillery has this orange fire rating. It's firing from long distances, explosive shells. Uh, it's a rating of four, um, which is average. Um, now, so we, we use that four as a basis. Then we look and see that it's a, a two-step unit. So most two-step units when firing have this possibility for a company bonus, okay? If they roll less than or equal to a troop quality check, they receive a plus two modifier in attack. So that's one of the first things you want to do is roll for your company bonus. Now you can see below attack modifiers there. Okay, and real quick before I do that roll, why is it showing a five even though I'm a four? Uh, okay, so you, because this is a densely packed hex, there are four steps of enemy units in this hex. Okay. Do, uh, I, do, I, need to, do I need to do anything with this? That is now, yeah, this shows the different units in the hex. So at present, it's defaulting to the infantry. If you click the right arrow, you can you can target different targets in this hex. Now, indirect fire is more effective against infantry. You'll notice the number goes down to two to hit, 
if you target the infantry, it's a five to hit. Regardless of who you target, so you're probably better off targeting the infantry, you'll still um, blind that hex, provided you don't roll a nine. So if I'd, I'd suggest you target the infantry here, try and get some hits on them. Okay, interesting. Uh, artillery is better against infantry. Armoured units just sort of... Uh, Company bonus. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Nope. So did you yeah, did you get that? Success, yep. So you've got a company bonus. So this this four now goes up to a six. Yeah. It's a den densely packed hex, which has already been taken into account. So it goes up to a seven. So you've now got a fire rating of seven. Now keep in mind, these units are out in the open. So there's no defense modifier uh, for terrain. They have an armor rating of zero, which is a little zero on my bottom, the bottom left of my infantry unit. Okay, so you're, you need a seven or less to cause damage to this unit. Okay. Which is pretty good. There's an 80% chance of getting a hit. Um, keeping in mind with this artillery, if you roll a no anything but a nine, we'll place a barrage marker. Quit saying that. You've said that two or three times now. Don't quit saying it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really. Uh... Okay, so you rolled a three, which is a cohesion hit. Um, Let me look on the chart here. So indirect against an unarmored target is a C for cohesion. Okay, good. Yeah. So I look at my infantry, I do combat, I mark cohesion hit. Now, because you're, you needed a seven or less, now this is another thing to keep in mind. With your artillery, there are two different types of barrage markers. There is a light barrage marker, and that's if the fire rating is five or less. Okay. And there's a heavy barrage marker, and that's if the fire rating is six or more. Now, okay. in this case, your fire rating was seven, so we place a barrage marker on my hex, and I flip it to show that's a heavy barrage. Can you see that there? Yep. Let me, um, yep. Now, that, all units in that hex only have a range of one now. So I can still kind of hit your adjacent units, but I can no longer target uh, these armoured units out on the left. The other effects of this heavy barrage marker is these units here suffer a minus two troop quality rating. They suffer a minus two firepower rating. If they try to leave this hex, they must pass a troop quality check to do so and there's a, a decent chance they'll fail that. So it really kind of it creates chaos in that particular hex, just from that one fire, fire uh, indirect attack. Okay. All good? That's good. So now that's it for artillery parks. Now I'm not going to do any onboard stuff. Yeah, so I think we can... Um... I also don't want to block... Um... The, the, the barrage is black or obscure line of sight, right? They block your, yeah, both lines of sight. Um, your line of sight, my line of sight, yeah. Okay. So here's a mortar here. We can't see anybody. I guess I can just look. Ah, so this is not part of your formation. This is a different division. Oh, oh it is. Um, this is the 711th Infantry Division, part of the 736th Regiment. They'll have a separate activation later. So these are the initial defenders around this area. Okay. Um, and so I think I asked this night in here, or don't remember the answer. So I'm still allowed to attach people, even though it's a formation activation, right? Yeah, you can attach independent units of that division. So they have to be black, um, the sort of black background units okay. uh, with a black or a white band. So the, the, all the black banded units are kind of automatically attached. So you can see uh, this unit uh, sort of here. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I think you're going to reactivate them, right? Or no? Yeah, there we go. Um, but those black banded units are kind of free attachments that don't count against your activation rating at present there aren't any other mm, independent units that you can attach so you pretty much um, you fired your one artillery now you can just activate the rest of um, those red and black banded units okay um so i kind of want to put something on this guy and i wanted to put something on this guy in 39020 yeah uh, you've got a, so that mortar unit up in the top left or you've got your indirect artillery down in the bottom left corner. Yeah, I guess. Oh, you know what? That's something I should have thought of because he can only fire people that I can see or I'm adjacent to. Uh, that you can that that a, a spotter can see. So he uses spotters again. He doesn't need to see them. He doesn't need line of sight um, if he's using indirect fire. Can it be an independent unit attached to me? To yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So if you want to fire on that unit near the home, 
he, he can be seen from your by your infantry way up in the top uh, left. So if you go up, yeah. So that unit there can see across the ridge and then down to there. Yeah, and this guy can see him, right? And... Uh, the other two units below, they're crossing two, cre uh, two crests, so they can't see it. Oh, really? But so even though they're on the same, it appears same level, that doesn't matter? Yeah, yeah it's a bit... Um, Oh, that's interesting. This is, yeah, most I mean most games have sort of elevation change, and it looks like they're on a plateau, but um, you can't cross the, the rules say you can't cross two crest lines. Think of the, think of the crest as like a gentle hill that blocks line of sight. Now, if you're right next to that hill, you can peek over it. But if there's a gentle hill on the left, and then another gentle hill, you've got two hills that you can't quite peek over. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got I got kind of mind off that normal or. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you only need one at one unit spotting. So that infantry at the top there, they can certainly spot. Okay. All right. So, all right. So then this guy. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to attack. I'm going to click on him. So this is only a one-step unit, this organic artillery. So you, you don't get the chance for a company bonus. It has a firepower of four, um, but these, these uh, it's, hard, it's hard to target these armoured units. So it has an armour rating of negative three, which reduces your firepower down to one or less. Wow. Okay. But, but I, the, so the, the advantage here is your barrage on them. So. Yep. All right, let's do it. Let's roll a one, and zeros are zeros, right? So, no yeah. effect. But, um, the main thing here is you get to place a barrage marker, so uh, combat barrage. Now, because your fire rating was less than five, uh, it's just a light barrage marker. When you're playing, um, when you're playing on the board there, so I don't know. If, I don't know if people caught this. I don't remember when we if we talked about it before we went live or not, but. Nathan mainly plays on, as you watch his videos, on the actual board counters and chits and all that, which I'm a, a fan of. Um, and I try to do that as often as I can. How do you keep track of this stuff? Um, I mean, you're usually activating about five to ten units in a formation. I, as you're doing here, I do my artillery first. Then I do the units that can move the further. So keeping in mind, when you're, I'll mention it now, when your units move in column, you can only ever have one unit in columns stacked in a hex. So you want to move your fastest units first, move them in column as far as they can. That way there's no traffic jams. Yeah. Uh, and once, it, once units have moved, um, you, you kind of know what's moved uh, because they're not in the same place. Um, you can see all units start off together. Sometimes I'll go from like left to right procedurally. Um, sometimes I might just kind of tilt them 45 degrees to show they've moved because there's no facing in this. Units can rotate. Yeah. Uh, okay. As curious as I'm going, it's so nice that it marks it green. So Gen Chaos said a couple. Uh, um, Gen Chaos made a few comments, and uh, yes, Gen Chaos. Pretty, yes. Yeah. Yep. You're right. It is a rough learning game. Pretty much a total noob. Pleasure dealing with the uh, pleasure dealing with me, which is another thing. Um, but uh, this was interesting. It's heavy barrage just calculate with the art units base rating and company bonus modifier only. Yeah, so we don't count, we don't take into account the uh, density of the hex. So there was a plus one um, because you had four steps. This added a plus one, which made it a, a seven instead of a six. Okay. But you're still uh, even with the six, you've got a heavy barrage marker. Just something yeah. to keep in mind. It was six with your company bonus, plus one is seven. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then he said, uh, any other negative mods? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so you've got, you've, you've fired, uh, now your organic artillery has used its first action. This is, you know, you now have the opportunity to, to spend a command point to have it do a second action. Now, with these second actions, you can't repeat the first action, so you can't fire again, but you could move with this unit. Um if you wanted to. The, what else could you do as a second action? Um, probably not much else at this stage. Uh, you can move, you can mount, dismount, you can 
rally assault action yeah Remember yeah Riga. i got the main... page five i'm using the version 2.0 rules that i pulled from my creek book for keep game but i have seen something that tells you that it costs something this doesn't actually tell you that it costs a command point so i like there's a, someone made something that tells you that so I'm gonna be good that. yeah the second second activations always cost you a oh, command God. point so okay. your main consideration is do you want to move with this artillery it's organic artillery so they're fired they can now move sort of further to the north if you want it costs a command point um well okay so what would i so my other things i mean these fighting uh <laughs> Tactical units, I'm going to want to be doing a lot of stuff with, right? So they're going to move, and they won't be able to move a second time. Yeah. I'm not too worried about that, I don't think. Because you can reach the whole board. Well, He's got a range of 17. So the white number just to the top right above his fire rating shows how far he can reach. Um, I don't know. Attack. So where can you reach to? If you just you can do like a little range, he can reach oh, pretty close to past Plumer Uh He can reach Strong Point Hillman. Uh, I can just be just just short of deliver on. Range from there, he'll be able to target all those sort of allied units um, in the south. I, as we're going through this, I just remember I remember something that I drove Ty crazy with. I think. Um, I kept forgetting that you do both your activations with the unit immediately. You don't like come yeah. first activation with everybody and come back and do second activations. That you do that yeah. And, um, and his movement is 11, right? Yep. Uh, 10. Uh, sorry, you're 11. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't seem worth it. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, think about your next unit. You've got now order got one, which is sort of unlimited and ready to fire up in the north. There's another one down the bottom. Oh, there's two. You've got two in the bottom left. These are half-track mortar units. So they can move and then spend the second action to fire as well. So you've got up to, up to five barrage markers, potentially. Um, I generally think it's worthwhile spending the second action on these mortars because mortar fire, particularly on infantry, is pretty effective. These green mortar, uh, these green mortar fire ratings do a lot of damage to infantry. So move them and then fire them. Yeah, I mean, you could, you might want to do the stationary one first. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because he's, he's ready to fire. He's a one-step unit. Most of the mortar units are one-step units. So again, he so um, yeah, mortars are slightly different. It's indirect fire. Um, they usually have a very short range of three to four hexes. So yeah, it's a base modifier of three. It's mass plus one. You, you just pick your target. So you're currently targeting the uh, allied AT guns. Now, allied AT guns are a good juicy target because they have this blue armor piercing round, um, but they have very weak armor, a zero armor rating. They're counted as unarmored. See so the, the white, so there are armored and unarmored units. Unarmored units are vulnerable and they have a white armor rating in the bottom left. See below the blue four, is that yep. zero? Yep. That means it's unarmored uh, and, and more vulnerable. They're, you're more likely to cause damage against these units when firing on them. The armored units have a black armor rating, and they are much, much tougher. It's much more difficult to cause a hit on those units. Um, so my, my AT guns here, they're powerful units. They're two-step, four blue, five power rating, but they're very vulnerable. And you can certainly easily wipe them out with mortifier. Let's do that. Yeah, give it a go. Uh, there you go. You rolled a suppression. Um, second best result. So what are we firing? It's here, isn't it? Yeah. Now, of course, there's two things. So first of all, I'll suppress my unit. Now, whenever you take a suppression, you can um, attempt to convert this to a cohesion hit. Okay. Okay. Uh, and you, you might want to do this if the unit is doing something very important or if it could potentially fire on your opponent. As it stands, these guys are going to be blind anyway, um, so I'll just place a suppressed marker on them. I don't want to suffer cohesion yet. I can rally from suppression. I can, it's, it's much more difficult to rally from cohesion hits. Okay. Okay. So, so the other thing here is you caused there'll be a light barrage in this hex. Uh, I'll place that now. Uh, it was light because your firepower, I think, was four or less. Four. It was four. 
26. Now you've caused um, indirect fire damage to a stacked hex. So every unit in that hex now needs to make a possible suppression roll. Um, and I'm just figuring out how to do that. So, so whenever you do, yeah, whenever you cause indirect artillery, indirect fire damage to a hex, um, and you cause a hit, yeah, all other units in that hex suffer the S question mark result. Okay. okay. What I'm going to do now is I'll roll for the infantry first. They have a troop quality of five. They technically we don't place a barrage marker until after they've done this. Okay. So they need five or less to pass this. They fail. So they are also suppressed. Now we get to my staff's yeomanry infantry. They have a troop quality of six. Uh, they need to pass this. They also fail. So you've, you've suppressed the entire hex. Wow. With that one mortar. And okay. then we place a barrage marker on top. Do those guys get to the opportunity to go for cohesion, or is that only the main target? Uh, only the main target. Yeah. Okay. So you you cause you you you're, you're targeting the AT guns. You cause you roll for damage on them. Every other unit, if you cause a hit, every other unit has to roll for possible suppression. And as it turns out, every other unit is kind of panicking. They're lowering their heads because of this this mortar fire. So they've they've got a light barrage marker on them. The line of sight is now reduced to one hex, so they can only see adjacent targets. They can't target your your units. Um, yeah, you, you've blinded a lot of those allies in the area. So yeah, it's cool. The, the, all the stats that it affects is on there, and it's and it's right in the same place that it affects. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, yeah, so General Chaos is just pointing out you can auto convert these results um, if the unit is in command. Uh, certainly, that's one of the main things I often spend command points on. So normally when you're attacking with armoured units and you suffer a, a suppression result, I'll often spend command points to automatically convert that to a cohesion hit. It, it's not worth the risk of um, yeah, getting suppressed when you're in a, in a desperate situation. Suppression is a, is a bad result. It means units can't do anything at all except rally from that suppression. Having said that, um, the the rally if they're in command is automatic so basically it delays these units think of it as they're they're losing an activation down the track mm -hmm. huh okay you've, yeah, you've mobilized that entire hex yeah i'll dig into that the, the difference between cohesion and suppression okay um and so my other indirects are mobile yeah so they will have to spend one activation to move because they're not in range of anything and then you'll have to spend a command point on each of them to have them uh, fire. And, oh, okay, you'd have a move because their range is short. I guess, right? Ooh. Yeah. Now, And I assume you can't fire from column, right? Um, you can fire from column. Um, you just have your firepower reduced by one. So I think this is sort of firing on the fly. They rush into battle. Um, yeah, they fire a few mortar rounds. I'm just trying to see where who they're going to get next or close to because they're going to have to be pretty close, and no one can spot for them, right? They um, trying to remember. Uh, road is okay mortar, mortar units uh have any in command unit of their formation spot for them generally they're not self-spotting because you kind of don't want them up in the front lines you want them kind of behind your infantry behind or in sort of good defensive terrain um so your actually your mortar unit that you just fired with this unit over here mm -hmm. 
Um, they're in a vulnerable position. Yes, you've kind of made um, them a little safer, but um, yeah, just be careful about counterattacks there. All right, another challenge with vassals, kind of getting a big picture view quickly and easily here. But um, okay. so let's look at some places that would be good to move them. So I'm kind of wanting to move them in a way that kind of, I guess. Yeah. Yep, that'd be good. That'd place them within four hexes of all those infantry, the AT guns in that area. Yeah. And so they have, they have, they have, they have line of sight as well. So, like maybe in this uh, Punto or whatever. I'd, uh, I'd be careful because as long as you can get some infantry to help them, um, again, you don't want them in the front lines. Um, you want them, the one on the left there, that's hedgerow to the left. That's great defensive terrain. So with hedgerow, there's a special rule with this. The the one below that, that's wooded terrain, just below that, 44014, is hedgerow. And units in hedgerows can only be targeted by enemies that are adjacent. Okay, so hedgerow, hedgerow. Green. Oh. 4405. Yeah, so direct fire attacks can only target um units in hedgerows if they're directly adjacent so for me to attack that mortar if it sits there my tanks my infantry would have to get right next to you i can still um bombard with artillery from a range you can still use indirect fire but not direct fire and my movement on the road for track is these are all just my well no yeah minor roads just roads so it's half other train and half i guess um for railroads are a bit different railroads are just one for a track unit okay uh, normal roads are half so one two Sorry, but I'm going to be zooming in and out here as I'm trying to figure out how to get these guys. All right, so what, I'm, what I should probably do is I should probably pull out the map of this and set it up. Uh, I can see the pieces too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, and to move into hedgerow and but if you're moving on the road into a hedgerow, you use the road movement cost. So whenever you're moving into any terrain, if you're moving through that terrain by a road, you use the road movement cost. So it would just be half. Would you need to be in column though? Uh, for a tracked unit to move into a hedgerow, you don't have to, but it's certainly a lot cheaper to do so. It would cost you half a movement point to move into that hedgerow by that road. It'd cost you two movement points to move into the hedgerow in column without oh. using the road. Oh, I think that's what I need to understand. To use the road movement cost, I have to be in column. Yes. Sorry, yep. Uh, that makes a difference. And you can only go in or out of column in, in a turn, right? Um, yeah, well, yes, you can only spend movement points to go into or out of column once, but what you can do is this mortar unit, just to give you an example, you can put this mortar unit into column that costs one movement point. You yeah. can move along that road into that hedgerow, spend however many movement points that costs. And then as part of your movement activation, you can, um, what, what you're basically doing is you're rushing these units hurriedly out of column and they suffer a cohesion hit to leave column. So they the penalty is a cohesion hit, um, but it, it, uh, it, it removes them from column. It's often a good idea. It's a good tactic to, to put a unit in column, rapidly move them around the map, and then force them out of column by suffering that cohesion hit. Um, so you can't, you can't spend them two movement points to move them in and out, but you can spend just the one movement point and then suffer the cohesion hit to take them out of column. Uh, I think of this as sort of rushing them out of column in a hurry at the end of their movement. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, um, well, let's just do it. Let's get some something happening here. And if it's not the right strategy, it's, that's no problem. So I'm going to take him and I'm going to move and I'm going to call him. So that's one point. Yep. And then um, Jen Chaos is reminding us that you need to be in column to cross a ridge as well. Yeah. So I guess just go. So I'd be half one. 
don't know if you got you can see me doing that. No. Oh yeah, you can. No, I don't. Know. Can you see me moving that? F one, two, three. So I'm right there for now for three. Four, five, six, seven, and then seven and a half, eight. Okay. Yep. Yeah, good. And there's so people can see, and I can see. Whoa. So now you can't spend a movement point to take them out of column because you've already spent that point to put them in, but you can take a cohesion hit to take them out of column. Um, or you can leave them in column for now and spend a movement action later. There's a lot of kind of decision making around here. Usually you're taking that cohesion hit when you're in a rush. And as this is a two turn scenario, you might be in a rush, for example. Yeah, let's just do that so we can see what happens there. So. I don't have to do any tests. I just go into a cohesion and go out of call. So I want to go column. Yep. And then I guess combat probably. So let's yeah. see what a cohesion does. So it reduces my quality rating, it reduces my firepower, and it reduces my range. No, that's your range. Uh, that's your assault rating. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So minus one firepower rating. I mean, they don't want to be assaulted. If they're in a position where they're being assaulted, they're already in trouble. Um, your range is still four. Um, minus, yeah, that's okay. It's mainly their, their firepower. It's slightly right. reduced. So um, now I can spend a command point to do something else with them if I want. Yeah, like um, like fire, for example. Oh, that's down here. Oh, man. This is a, this is a big, uh, vessel modules are big. I think I need to clean off my computer. I'll take my command points down to 11. Now, they can, they can have the, the unit from their formation, or they can self-spot. So they can see uh, my A1st South Lancashire unit infantry on 41015. They can see my AT guns. They can see the two... Um, infantry to the north. Um, villages. So there's a subtle difference between villages and towns. Those two hexes to the right of that unit are villages, and uh, villages don't block line of sight. But the town of Cresseron, just to the north, you can see it's a darker brown. Yeah. It it does block line of sight. So a yeah. subtle difference. Um, towns have better defense ratings. They block line of sight. Uh, yeah. Villages don't. Think of villages as sort of a slight scattering of, of houses and so forth. Oh. On, out of command, sorry. Steve's pointing out that this unit's out of command. I didn't realize that. Where's your leader down here? Where? Yeah. Okay. Command rate. Oh, he's just out of command by two hexes. Oh, uh, shoot. Sorry about that. Hmm. Still, he's in a good position. Um, for next yeah. time. Okay, perfect. All right, so now I need to find my other mortar here. I'm going to move him to. So he's down here. He's got a firepower of five. Ooh, okay. Ten movement. Let's move up here so we can see where his command rating is. Move him back out. I'm going to click that again. Okay. So, hmm. Your command, your command range extends no like just before those hexes. So that's the limit of your command range to see the yeah. visual. Can you move on column on clear land? Yep, it uh, normally costs one movement point for most units. Oh, so the, the so the movement here slash is uh, uh, yeah on the traffic column yeah first the first number is regular if it is moving across um, usually when they're in close range to the enemy the second number is in column which is when they're doing sort of big movement along roads um, such as what you're doing now yeah that's a bummer so he really can't get anywhere to fire 
that's in a nice protected area. I mean, you could go here to this ridge, but then he's right there on the ridge. And I think, well, maybe I can move him up here, but then he's very vulnerable. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I guess just think about the future here. So, all right, I think I'll probably put him in the same spot if I can. So we'll go column one. Hey, he's kind of in a weird spot here. One, two. What railroad doing anything weird? Nope. Um, he's not going to be able to get that far. So we still got 10 movement in column. Two and three. Four. All right, let's just do it. So one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. You can, get, you can just get there. <laughs> I lost my count there. It's coming into my head. Two, um, three. Oops. Boom. Same thing. Okay. Now, just a matter, of, and I can't fire him because he's out of command. Okay, so that's something to consider then. All these other guys that could maybe move up and rush, they're going to get out of command. Yeah, but um, most of them won't be in a position where they want to take a second action anyway. I mean, okay. you can't do... Yeah, they, they can only really fire. Um, your army units, they might want to fire, but as, as Steve pointed out, you can move your leader um, first, which will change his... So um, Steve pointed out, you, you have to spend a command point to move your leader mm. uh, with a unit. But, uh, and to do that, you need to have that as a second action. So your first action is free. You're not spending a command point, so it can't be the first action. So that, that uh, the unit around here in 38023, um, well, they're kind of, if you move, oh yeah, it's, it's a risk. Because if you move them, um, they're going to suffer a lot of um, potential opportunity fire from those surrounding units. It's, you can do it. Um, but these are, this is infantry in a village with a zero defense modifier next to some nice big tanks. Yeah, but that, that's one way to kind of, and then they'd have to, they'd have to go a long way around too. Um, oh yeah, because there's a bridge there. They, they, uh, they have to come down south and hook around the roads. It'd be a long way for him to go. Um, and if, if you're in column, someone else can't be in column. Um, no, you can have you can have multiple units in column. You just can't move through. You can't move. You can't have you can't have two units in column stacked together, and that includes during movement. So a unit in column can't move through another yeah. unit in column. They have yeah. to go around. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and that wood uh, that costs a lot in a yeah, you can't even you can't even go through woods and wield. Because he's he would travel with that unit, right? He'd travel with that. Yeah, yeah. Um and I mean putting him putting that unit into column is an activation, is, is a movement, and every unit will get to opportunity to fire. And then moving them out of that hex is another movement, and every unit will be able to opportunity to fire. So you have four, at least four units. What do I have five there? Yeah, four units, opportunity firing. Uh, what else have I got behind the line? Oh, there's a big, um, what are these, assault infantry behind the lines. I've got a range of two. This unit here, this Middlesex company, would be 
opportunity firing as well. Uh, you'd be <laughs> you'd be moving into the line of sight. So it'd be plus firepower. It's it's a it's a dangerous move, basically. Yeah. So don't do it. I'd advise against it. But yeah, look, if you uh, yeah. So I need to get cranking here. So it looks like in column. So I. I already put these guys in column because we were just looking at it. So that would be a cost point, this infantry. And it's got 23 movement in column. So like you said, want to move him first. Yep. Yeah, I don't see anyone else. Well, all these guys down here. But um, one thing. So this unit, this thing, you see my infantry here? I've just noticed these guys. Which guy? They, this is this, uh, how I highlight this unit. This guy's, I've just further to the north. Oh, where are you? Which oh, sorry, which unit are you activating? Oh, down south there. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So that guy's in column, that guy's in column. So those guys in column are gonna have to go. Oh, holy cow. How do they even get? So look, I'm looking at these guys over here. Yep. How are they supposed to get over that ridge? Um they can't right now. Uh, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is Cunt Griff Opel. They were focused on sort of blunting um, the, what is it? I think they're highlighted because I can't activate them. 185th Brigade. Uh, you, you can activate them, but um, they can't do much out on the left. Yep. Okay. Well, then forget that, you guys. This guy's kind of stuck out here too. That's another independent unit, so I'm not going to worry about those. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out who who I've got and what's going on. I mean, they, they could they could, uh, they could move sort of around to the right towards Blainville, try and circle around Hill 61. Um, they could threaten the 185th. They they do a lot of damage these units. They decent armor rating, decent firepower, so they could sort of hurt me in the center. Um, what you could do is you could threaten my rear with these units. Oh. Um, there's a lot of potential. These are good units. These are three. You know, heavily armored, um, medium tanks, medium slash light tanks. Again, they've got that um, the two steps, dual purpose guns. I kind of need to see what I've got as far as independence. So it looks like I've got one, two, three independents that are on this side of the ridge, right? And I'm I have five. How many more? That people can I activate five more. Oh, you can no. The, the black banded units are all free, so you don't have to worry about numbers oh. anymore. They're yeah. all free, free activation. Which ones do you pay to activate them? Only the white banded units, such as your your off map artillery, is the only one they have to pay for. Is that so only the case? You only pay for white banded. Yeah, yeah. So when you get to bigger scenarios, you'll have a lot of these independent units coming on, engineers, AT guns. And you have to think carefully about which ones you want to prioritize. But in this scenario, you've only got the one. Okay. Yeah, you've got another. You've got another one coming on, but you don't have to worry about that command limit. Okay, everybody. So, all right. So this guy needs to get going here. So the question is: Is am I going to want to bring my troops through here? I don't necessarily want to get them too far ahead, right? Because my tanks are going to be like 10 hexes behind me because they can only move 13 to 16. Troops, I'm almost wondering if I, you said some of my tanks could get up there though, so let's take a look at that. And I need yeah. to take... Um, the, yellow, the yellow firepower, this is a direct high explosive. They've got 15 movement. Um, I think they can make it. Um, I think... Your pen, the, the Panzer fours, the three one Panzer twenty two. I think they can make it. So one, two, three, four, five, six. You might be able to get close. And I'm trying to take uh, Leon Surmir. Well, or, or just that pink road next to it. You just you just need to occupy part of that pink road to win the scenario. Oh. So you yeah. like Lutzermeer? Um, so what, what is the objective? It's uh, interdict the road, have a unit or minefield on any hex of the road from 45005, which is way at the top left, through to 35009. So 
So any any just occupy one hex of that pink road is enough to at the end of the scenario is enough to win. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't even necessarily want to get up there and fight you there. I want to get up there and then make you and then I defend. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, so I do. I could take my. All right. Well, here's my thought. I'm going to take out my my uh, troops then and put them in that town. All right. So I put them in column. So that's one. Yeah. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, shoot. There, that's seven to there. Seven to there. So, seven. sorry. Just, just sorry. Just backtrack a bit. Yeah, uh, that, that jumped up when I scrolled the screen. So, where did they start from? Man, my, I'm sorry, my map is really scrolling slow here, so it's really jumpy here. So I might just backtrack it. Um, yeah, that was an accident. So that was an accident. <laughs> All right, so they started there, right? Yeah. Okay, so just as they're about to leave this hex, can you see my unit? Oh, just, sorry. No, you're right. I, I, wasn't, I was watching down the bottom of the screen. Um, so they have a range of two. Can you see? I'll just move them out of the way. See this unit here? Next to their uh -huh. fire that little two, um, they have an opportunity. They can see you. They can yep. peek above this, this slope. They can see um, there's a blocking terrain the town, the town, but the clear terrain. They can see along the hex side of blocking and clear. Okay. Um, so need, okay. So they can opportunity fire if they roll a six or less, which they fail anyway. <laughs> now, my tank behind them can't see them because it's not next to the slope, and I think they'll be blocked by the town anyway. Um, you've blinded those other units so they can't see so that yeah, sorry go ahead. Yeah, okay But that, uh, that's cool though. So in the, when I was doing all the mortar firing could I have used That infantry unit to spot to mortar them Yeah, yep, they could see them. Okay. Yeah. Cool. In, in, yeah, yeah All right, awesome so Two three Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten and a half. Um, mounting and dismounting is once per turn or uh yeah one so uh oh actually it costs half your movement points to dismount okay well I, and i should say remember they were actually they were dismounted when we started so that would have been half movement to mount oh, no, well, it, um it costs their full movement to mount up oh yeah sorry i didn't realize okay so um, then they move at all can they can they start mounted i don't think they can Dismounted. They, yeah, were, Sorry. they were dismounted when we opened up the scenario, but yeah, so it costs their whole movement point to get up into their trucks. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. This is the way to learn it. I just wonder if they could have. I'm just looking. At it. it didn't. They don't really say. Here. Yeah. Um, okay, so it says um, units can set up mounted or not, column or not. So you can set up the start the scenario with them mounted and in column, and they can move there freely. So because they started mounted, um, they can. How much? How many movement points have you spent now? Is that uh, that was ten and a half? Yeah. Well, now you can dismount them in that hex. Okay. Uh, ten and a half, eleven and a half gets them out of column. And then you dismount them, yeah. Um. So, so you, okay. Yeah, so the general scenario instructions are all units may set up mounted or not, in column or not, except where otherwise noted. Okay. Do, 
Do uh, infantry move in column? I'm curious. Yeah, they can. Yep. Okay. But I did not put him in. Oh, well, wait. I mean, I have to get this clear. They do have to go in column, though, to use road movement and stuff. Yeah, right? but again, they can set up in column. So they, we let's let's imagine that they started the scenario in column and mounted up and ready to move out. And then they've um, moved along those roads in column in their trucks. They've reached Luke Samaire and they've dismounted and they're now defending the city. Okay. Yeah, so, and as I'm reading the setup, it looks like some they put them in column and then yeah. some they don't say anything. If it's, if it's specified, you have to follow that. But if it's not specified, I think you get a choice generally. Yep, and this one was not specified. So cool. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I, I know this might be painful for people watching, but this is exactly the kind of thing that's good for me to hear all the little nuances of. I think this is the kind of thing that trips me up and stuff. So it's good to. Uh, so. Uh, perfect. All right. So they're in town, man. They are set up and ready to yep. go. Yep. And that's a good position because it's hard to get line of sight to that hex. They've got the Vitistan nest right in front of them. You can't get line of sight through that city hex. You can't get line of sight through the town south of them. So the allies have to get really close to fire up on those guys. Does it? Is there any advantage of getting in that hex with that? Um, uh, pros and cons. Pros are they help defend that first hex. Cons are they can be fired on from a greater distance to the southeast. I got you. Okay. So I just maybe want to move a tank in there with them, maybe put a tank in loops mm -hmm. somewhere on the mm -hmm. outside. So tanks can only move into cities if they stay in column. Um, actually, oh. I think um, well, they, have, they have to move in cities in column. It's, it's much more difficult for them to, um, for armored units to defend in cities um the rules are wheeled and tracks units can't enter a city hex unless in a column and those units in a city city hex may never leave a column and because they'll be in column they'll suffer a plus two armor modifier and they ignore the city's defensive benefits so it's not a good idea to put them in cities generally you want to keep your armored units out of the city wow okay so maybe uh how about towns and um Towns are slightly better. They can um, they can leave column in town, but so what? If you move an armored unit into a town, uh -huh. they have to be in column to get uh, into the into the town. But once they're in there, they can leave column and become stationary in that town. So that's good if you're defending to put these armored units in a town and then dismount them, and they kind of set up good defensive positions in the town and use that. Uh, I think it's a minus one modifier, which helps these armored units. So something like just south of Luke Samir, those two town hexes are great defensive terrain for your armoured units. You've also got just to the right near Lyon Samir, you've got Le Ho Lyon. So little as a defender, you don't want minus numbers. No, as a defender, you do want minus numbers. So any negative... Um, so look at your armoured units. It, the, the big tanks have a negative three. So they're really heavily armoured. This is about as good as you get, negative three. Um, and this reduces the attacker's firepower when targeting, that's a bad one, <laughs> that's a zero. But look to your right, those more heavily one, heavily armoured ones, they've got negative three. They're really strong, really tough, hard to hit. So any attacker firing on that unit will reduce their firepower by three. Now, if they are based in a town, it'll be a further minus one, so again, it's a negative four. So if I attack you with like a dual purpose gun with six armour rating, it's reduced to two um, and, and more difficult to get a hit. So negative numbers on the defense are good for the defender. Okay. If you put a unit in column, um, the, it adds a positive, um, yeah, positive modifier. So I'm going to move this guy in column. Can anyone see them? So he moves out of that hex. I don't think so. Yeah. So see the column marker on the left there shows a plus two. That's it's, it means it's bad for your. Uh, for your defense rating. Two. I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and think about which tanks and units are the best absolute defense just trying to get there. So <laughs> I've used three. Man. I can't imagine what this would operate like if I had the whole campaign going here. 
Uh, you get the hang of it pretty quick, and yeah. Well, I mean, my computer. <laughs> Six, eight, seven. So I'm thinking it might be nice to have these guys eight. Um, kind of here to kind of defend the you know flank if you guys come in and yep. the thinking there. Um, so yeah, you said I'm in a hurry, so it's probably a good idea to go out of column. Yeah. When when will cohesion hits? How's that come off? Yeah, so, so you've put them in column. Um, you to take them out of column. You can take a cohesion hit right now to take them out of column. When and when will that? Ah, so when you get rid of cohesion hits, you can do a rally action uh, to remove cohesion hits. Uh, rallies, the rally action varies depending on if they're in command or out of command and whether they're in line of sight or out of line of sight. So when you do a rally, at, at present, this unit is not in the line of sight of an enemy unit, but it's not in command. So if they do a rally action uh, as their second action, you'd need to spend a command point because it's their second action. And then they need to pass a troop quality check to remove that cohesion. So you could right now, you've moved as your first action. For your second action, if you want, you can attempt to rally. If you want. But he's not in command. But he's not in command, so it's not automatic. He has to pass a troop quality check. Oh, actually, sorry, you'd be spending a command point, so you can't do a second action. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Am I going to be able to get... Oh, okay, I think I, you told me. Sorry. So, so let me just do some moving. I guess I'll, I'll be quiet for a minute. Um... Quit talking here so I can think about what I'm doing. So it's 15, this guy here. Yeah, I'm definitely setting this up. Let's see. I wonder. Maybe this is all a faint. I'm gonna. I'll then move from there and go get um, Pegasus Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> all hold strong point sixty one. I mean, this is a tough nut to crack. The fortified fortified area uh, is a negative three modifier. You do have the strong point, which is um, negative two, so it's a negative five modifier on any unit attacking that strong point. Um, yeah, it's 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 not easy. Just to, just to do it, I'm going to move up the tracks here. One. So this is only for tracked units. It's one movement point per railroad track. Yep. Two. Oh, I'm moving two units at the same time. Is that okay? <laughs> Uh, I don't know, actually. I never do it. <laughs> well, I'm not going to be able to do anything with them. I think I mean, you can, yeah. I mean, just in, no, no, just expedite. Four, five, six, seven. And, I mean, if something comes up, we can. I can always move them back. Yeah, units that are stacked together can move together. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. Um, except if they're in column, of course, you can't have two units in column together, but yeah, otherwise if they're stacked together, um, you can't pick up units, you can drop units off, but then they're done, yep. So he's at eight right now. I gotta kind of think about this, um, this side over here too. It's kind of flanked here. Yep. So you'll have a 711 division activation uh, counter in the cup. So it will come out and those units will get to activate. 
Um, that will, they'll get a division activation. I don't know if they're... This, they're also part of the 736 Regiment, and I don't know if they're... 736, they're not in the cup. Um, so they... they yeah, but they're often... These, these grey, the light grey slash white units are typically very immobile, inactive. They're just kind of bunkering down and defending. They're typically not doing much attacking or firing, typically. Occasionally, they'll get a few command points, which I can spend. Um, but generally, they're, yeah, immobile and just sort of roadblocks. Well, here's what I would do with you guys, and it's it's exactly 11 to get to the woods for both of them. So because they're in the woods, they have to stay in column. You can't uh, have armoured units out of column in woods. They're moving through. Yep. Oh, you, hold on, sorry. Do you have two units there? Oh, they're both moving in column. Sorry, so you can't move. Uh, you can't have two. Units oh, in that's right. I couldn't. Well, okay, so I couldn't have done that. But you can just separate them. Have one sort of land behind, uh, move behind the other. Think of them as sort of moving in column down the road on yep. their way. Yeah, you can do that. Sense. Yeah. So move. In effect, what you've done is you've moved one first, and the other one's just following up behind. Typically, you'll have like a long column of columns, a formation trickling down the road like this. And they can't overtake, so they're just kind of in a in a queue. So what is that unit? Is that a town or a village? Looks like it's a town. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Sometimes where you are here, um, yeah, you can, you can move um, across open terrain as well if you need to. Okay. Ten. 11. Yeah, I'm going to put him out here. So 10, 11, 11 and a half. So we got 13, I think. Yep. And I will just keep taking those cohesion hits. They're pretty tough. It takes a while to, if, if a unit takes a third cohesion hit, they take a step loss. But these guys are hard to hit, to be honest. Yeah. Especially my infantry. Um, yeah. So these, so that's a mortar unit that has to be adjacent to somebody. It's just a it's got like a little small arms machine gun, perhaps LMG maybe mounted on it. Oh. Um, I think is it. But yeah, let me ask you a question. I kind of get confused. There's kind of a purple column on this for light mortars. Is that what that's supposed to be? Is that no, so the the allies have light mortars, so my infantry units have the light mortars. This, these are very powerful um, units because they can. I'll explain this later. But the purple on my infantry are light mortars. Your little okay. pink unit is a small arms. It's probably the least effective. This is just a light recon. This unit here, um, in what's that town called? Forty five oh two four is a light recon. Um, yeah, it's probably got a little light. Um, Wow. Okay. Okay. My, my, I know one thing I got screwed up on. You're not going to be able to see this on here, but my, my small arms is like red on this document. On the, yeah, mine is too. They fixed that on the um, Operation Mercury charts, uh, pinker. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like, 
I'm like, where is that? I remember running into that. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So um, sorry, everybody. There's not more fighting here. It's just uh, it's a lot of movement. Oh, there will be in a moment. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Um, so can he go out of column in a city or not? No. no he's red. He's red. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. But he could in a village. Yep. In the town. Oh, wait. We're right. We're uh... right. Well, right now he's sitting there. With eight, nine, ten. If he's in a town, he can, just not a city. Yeah. I see about putting them here. So eight, nine, ten. And why not? So villages, um, just keep in mind with villages, they don't give any defensive modifier to armored units. So treat treat them as sort of effectively open terrain if armored to them. There's not much to hide behind. So I might want to put them up there in that town hexed with the tank. Perhaps. Okay. Do that. I think I need to take them out of column here. I don't know if I did that. All right, boys and girls, when you're getting ready to run a large vassal module, and you have an old computer coming off your whatever cache or whatever. Okay, so oh boy. Okay, so I've got um, this is my last red unit to move and i guess if there's any in the independence i want to move around i can do that too like maybe like you're saying go over there but i might anyway so column can, it's going to cost me to into that Ooh. one oh, no. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm giving Nathan a lot of time to think of what he wants to do. Maybe. I haven't even looked at my units yet. I've just been looking at yours. I think I might have miscounted here. Shoot. Um, it's a town. Town, town, town. Note three. By the way, I appreciate everyone who's jumped on to watch this. Um, I've seen some people pumping on there. So it's taking me a little bit more concentration and uh, to do this. Um, so thanks all for jumping on. Al Red Sox fan, I saw you on there. I appreciate that. Good channel for those who like sports. Uh, looks like Chaos has been pit, uh, piping in there, probably tearing his hair out, but I haven't been able to get my play. Um, 
All right, so I guess the question is, do I want to go ahead and move some of these units? Like maybe a, one thing you're thinking, like I can move them up here to kind of defend. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, there's, there's options with them. You could sort of attack, attack straight, down, straight down the middle. You could um, move towards Blaineville. Um, keeping in mind, I'm going to respond to what you're doing. And um, one, one consideration in the GTS series is you don't want your opponent to move around freely. So even if you can sort of pin me down, keep me occupied, threaten my flanks, it prevents me having free movement, free, free response. Um, and who knows, maybe you'll capture Pegasus Bridge in the process. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I might as well do it. I got five units I can act it. Well, no, they're done counting against us. Never mind. Yeah. So you've got to be careful right here. So there's this, there's a few ridges. There's a, few, a lot of wooded terrain. And armored units can only move into wooded terrain by roads. So they've got to be careful how they get around. I mean, like I said, I could just go attack these guys up here, like this big brown blob by my commander. But that's not one of my objectives, though, right? No. I mean, so I wouldn't, as I learned in today's earlier game in Lock and Load, don't get distracted by the pretty things. Get, go straight for the target. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would think maybe one of my potential things I would do would I do like your thing about keeping them busy. That's a good war game thing anyway. And I can get around that way easier than I can go trying to go left. It's essentially blocked for me. Yeah, I mean, there's a potential. I mean, look, there's a little... Uh, where can you get there? It's, it's a hard road to go, but if you can kind of come around the back of St. Aubin, Dakinay, through Blaineville, oh, who knows what might happen. Um, your, your heavily armoured units can really cause a lot of damage to my infantry out in the open. Um, my infantry have an armor rating of zero. In clear terrain, that's a zero modifier. And your armor units can get up to a sort of six, seven, eight with a company bonus firepower. And if they roll well, they'll instantly eliminate these infantry companies out in the open. So there's two guys there, yeah. You roll, a, I think, a seven or an eight, six, seven or eight with a dual purpose gun, you'll kill them instantly. That's two steps in one hit. So really, there's no disadvantage. Well, not no, but it really allows me to, because when the, this yellow, sorry, I don't have his name memorized. When the yellow, Oppen, Opa, whatever it is, when that other unit activates, those black units will also get to activate, right? Uh, yeah, yep. Because they're independent. Yeah, he can, he, he can attack into his command. Now, Steve's saying that you can assume that the roads connect one hex off the bottom of the map here, 40, 0, 3, 1 in effect. Yeah, so there's a... So you could come down the bottom and then reconnect on the left-hand side, pull them back and then go up to the north through Epron. Mm-hmm. There's so many choices. This is a hard part of the game. You know what, let, let's just do something different. Let's move them up over there. So I think, so it looks like what I pretty much need to do here is I can go through a, by the way, everybody, I love how GTS does this, where they just, they use the little center dot and that tells you what kind of te uh, terrain it's in there. I think that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. So you don't have to go like, is that a, well, I mean, you just have to memorize the colors, but. Um, so I can move into that village hex there. So I could go like this and go one two and then be on the road and start using my road movement uh yep three oh wait i gotta i can activate this unit way over here no i i could like fire him or something yeah yeah yep Some stuff over there so one two three Four, five, six, seven. Now, do I want to get right up next to you, seven, or is it better to stay back? Um, I think it's better to stay at least one hex away because all my infantry in this area have a range of one. They can only they can only shoot at adjacent um, units. Um, and if you stay just one hex away where you are there, it prevents me targeting you at all. 
Um, none of these units can, can shoot at you. I mean, they'd have to leave their trenches to, to move. To, uh, to attack you, sorry. Oh, and I am I allowed to look at stacks or not? Probably not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you can freely look around. So I, was, I think it was a seven or eight there. I don't know. I'm, so... Well, I might as well, well I'll move here and then no point to move there. Yeah, and then I haven't, it's already in column, so I can take them out of column without a problem. Yeah, if they start in column, yep, one movement point. Right, to get out of movement column. available. Yep. Now I can maybe actually do something because I'm within command. <laughs> so you check it. Yeah. These tanks here, the ones you just moved, these are old French tanks from 1940 that the Germans requisitioned as German tanks. Yep, R35, I believe. Sorry? I think Renault 35 is what those were. That looks like that's looking like. Uh, yeah. Actually, that might be a Somwa, so that's a bigger, oh, that's a heavier one, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he can do a second activation, right? Yep. So in command, you can, you got to spend a command point. Yep. Did I already spin one and I never put it back? I think I, yeah, I, I moved him down to 11 because I thought I spent I never moved him back to 12 yeah. when I learned I was out of command. All right, so then I guess we're going to see some of that fire action here. Yeah, so pick your target. So do the control A. Yeah, I'm going to write, write down all those cheat codes too. I'm oh, sorry, that was activate. Yeah. Oh, what is it? What's the combat? The combat is Alt, Alt A, sorry. All right, so two units in the hex. One is a two-step unit. One is a one-step unit. Does it matter? I mean... Um, I don't know. Um, we, well, you, I mean, if you, roll, if, if you roll a six, you could eliminate the two-step. Um, so you've got a one in ten chance of eliminating the two-step. Um, so what am I looking at? I'm looking at a dual purpose gun at an unarmored target. And you're saying if I oh yeah. seven eights eliminate. Yeah, so a roll of one or five will cause a step loss, which will eliminate the one step unit. A roll of six will eliminate the unit regardless of how many steps it's got. And anything in between is a suppression or a cohesion hit. If you roll more than um, well, first of all, you've got you're doing um, direct direct fire. Uh, so you've got uh, Fire, troop quality of six, fire value of four. You've got the potential for a company bonus if you roll less than six. Oh, oh, is that under up? No, for some reason it de defaulted to opportunity fire. Oh, weird. Okay, yeah, yeah. cool. Um, well, all right, well, let me roll for company bonus and I have a question. So I'm looking to roll under that six. Yep, or six, six under. Six. Got it. All right, so let me ask you a question real quick. I think this might have screwed me up a little bit. So that moves my – I've added that to – Yep. To the four, correct? That's right, yep. Now, that would normally be six. What am I – oh, because the range is two. Okay. Yeah. So if you're firing an adjacent target, there's no modifier. With unarmored targets, every additional range beyond that first hex is minus one. So because it's range two – Two minus, yeah, two is minus one. Range three would be minus two. Range four would be minus three, like that. Okay. Well, so, let me ask you a question. So if I look at the chart here, and you said roll a six and eliminate, I see that on my chart and table here. Uh, yeah. But yeah, don't I want to roll less than a five? Isn't that what that five's for? No. Yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot about that range modifier. Uh, without the range modifier at six or less. Uh, I'm thinking, okay, so uh, that would have been a reason to move next to them, but I'm not going to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. If you roll next to it, you'd have four infantry firing at you. Um, or is that present? None of these guys are going to fire at you. So it, it, it's, it's one. How'd you go? Suppression? Cool. So they are suppressed. Done. And that was a direct fire, so no other units in that hex are targeted. And you could you could try for a cohesion hit if you wanted. That yeah, always I, could, I could again. I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, okay, so that's always the case. All right. So I don't know if this guy's going to be able to. So I don't know what. This is obviously some vassal thing. I don't know what that little. That's a strong point. 
Oh, the hill. It's on a strong point. Okay. Yeah, I've forgotten what they do. Um, strong points. So one, two, three. You can trace line of sight um, through as many as two hexes with blocking terrain. So if you've got a unit on that hex, it helps spotters spot, basically. And then I'm going to pay a command point to fire again because that was so much fun. And now I'll just stack the other box there because why not? Same. So I'll hit that. It's on direct fire. Yep. Company bonus. Come on, baby. Man, I'm getting them like crazy today. Yep. Um, so again, you might as well be unarmored. Uh, no, you're over nine. Yep. And what about this guy over here and that guy up there? I'm going to do something with him. I mean, I guess, uh, I don't know if there's a concern that I want to keep that, keep you honest down here, but in some ways I'm like, well, I'm, I got to go up for things up north, so you got to come get me, I guess. I also might want to use them for this guy. Who's, so who's under this guy's command, this yellow guy's command? Where are they even? I don't even see his units. They're, they're reinforcements. They're about to come on when you draw the division activation. Yeah, let me look who he's getting. Maybe I want to save some of that armor for him. No. So basically it looks like a bunch of Panzer Grenadiers and... Yeah, I think I might want to save the tanks for them. But they'll be moving on. So they can catch up with them, actually. So let's move them. I guess you can as well use units if you can use them twice. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've watched some of Ty's when he was playing that large market garden game. Was this both, uh, both uh, map, you know, the whole, both games combined? That's a yeah. lot. Yeah, this is what's going on there, man. <laughs> yeah, Vassal makes it all feasible. It kind of keeps track of what units have been activated. Um, I can't imagine playing any of those games without Vassal. It went, you know, went months or whatever. And yeah. I think that green thing there is a. I think it's woods, so it's not passable at all. Man, these, guys are, these guys are hemmed in here, man. Yeah, as Steve said, take them off the bottom of the board down 40031 and imagine there's a, a row Connector. at the bottom. Yeah, just kind of like I'll place a little column marker there. Where that column marker is down the bottom, they kind of the rows link up. Four, so five. No, oh, that'd be four, four and a half, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think eleven was his movement. Yep. So I'll just keep him and call him because he's kind of far from the action. Maybe kind of. Yeah. So that um, direct that yellow fire rating is direct high explosive, and it's again very effective against infantry. Um, less effective against armored units. Think of this as an artillery um, that you have to self-spot for. Um, mm. Got a range of three. That's pretty good. Yeah. I don't know. I'll just even call just to see what goes, what happens here. So um, movement, I could sit there and think about it forever. And not my decision-making would not be based on any sort of facts. One, two, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I'll keep him and call him. 
I think that's it. I think I'm actually. Oh nope, I got these units over here. Let's zoom in here. Yeah, you got two on the right. You got one just under the leader here as well, on thirty-eight oh two six. Oh yeah. Let's move him over there. Oh wait, let's see. Oh darn. Come on now. One. Oh jeez. One. Two. Three. Shoot. So I'm gonna. I change my mood. If that's cool, I'd actually go. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. I wonder if. Seven. And seven, and that is, oh, what is that? Seven. Um, the town? No, that's, what is that? Yeah, Blaineville is just a village, so it's, um, is that what are looking at, Blaineville? Oh, the wooded, which one? The wooded kind of wood at the end of Benville there. That's a town, yeah. That's a town hex. So you, you, you can see, you do have line of sight to my hex here because this hex is clear. So again, you can you can you can see you, you can trace line of sight along a, a hex side that runs between a blocked and an unblocked line of sight. So I can see your troops in there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. So you got some you got little defensive modifiers there. Oh yeah. Trenchmen. Oh yeah. And they're treated as armored units. There's a lot there. So it's minus two for the trench, minus one for the para, minus two. There's a minus five modifier and they're oh. armored. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. It's a, it's it's a tough nut. That's one. That's what I'm almost tempted to get it right next to. If you're really going to do it, yeah. Well, you basically need to roll zeros and gradually build up cohesion hits because these are armored units, so there's not an instant hit. They're just gradually building up those cohesion hits, and they're two. Oh, there's only a one step power there, um, but there's a lot on the bridge. Um, four steps on the bridge. I mean, I just wonder. Like, it's like I'm thinking. Like, again, do I waste my time with that, or do I? You know what? I'm not. I'm gonna go. <laughs> Seven, eight. Huh. So if I go eight, nine, ten. Now it's as far as I can get and still fire. Oh, did I? I was in. I started in column, so that's good. I think nine. No, that's ten, and then I go out of column for eleven. Cool. And then I'll for another command. Put me down in single digits. And yeah, okay. and you'll, you'll get at least 10 when you get your division that, activation. Is that normal? That's a lot, isn't it? Or is that kind of normal? Um, 21st SS Panzer has probably one of the best command ratings in the game. The 711 division, the other white units, they have basically a rating of zero. Uh, they're one of the worst. Oh, come on, man. I need a quality on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, all right. So, what can I do with? I mean, can so now you can move your leader. So your leader, which is over here in thirty-eight oh two three, at the end of the activation, he can move to any friendly unit. He just teleports, basically. Okay. Well, I need to. I got two more units to do something with here. I know it's been. Uh, what else have you got? That the. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Forget about those. Can I? I'm just looking at my formation activations, blah, 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 blah. So I would want, I want, I want to, oh, wait, that's just a step loss. That's not a rally. I don't do anything, nothing to do there. I just change your grenadiers. Are those Panzer Grenadiers mounted? Uh, these are the guys on the left, is it? Yeah. Um, 
I think uh, what's the what's the scenario set up say? Uh, where are they? Forty. What hex is this? Thirty one o two zero. Thirty one. Which is zero, they are dismounted, so they're on foot. That's all. With that one step loss. They are dismounted? Yeah. So shouldn't they or oh, never mind. That is their dismounted status. I'm sorry, I saw that. Yeah, so most canners are double sided, so you just flip a unit when it takes a step loss. Um, but units that have sort of uh, their organic transport like those guys require the step loss counter. So he can attack that yep. next to him? Yep. So, yep. Let's give it a go. I'm sure it won't do much, but. Yeah, you basically you need a zero to hit, but see so how you go. So it's a one step unit because he's suffered a step loss. So there's no company modifier. Lots of defensive bonuses. So, again, you need, need a zero to hit. So I mean, I'm just going to since we're kind of like, I've already taken the long time to do this, let me just go through here. So he's at a four. He's, normally he's a four defense anyway. No, minus one. He's a minus one. So he's four, four attack, uh, minus one for the step loss. So he's down to three. Yeah. Uh, he's a one step unit because of the step loss. So he can't get a company bonus, which is why it's not appearing. Yep. And then um, the defending unit is in a town. It is entrenched. And it has an innate base defense rating. So it's three minus five is you know, minus two, but the lowest you can go is zero. And a zero will always hit. Um, so regardless of how many negative modifiers there are, a zero will always hit. Well, here we go. It's about to hit. Or not. I mean, I think <laughs> well, there you go. Get your mind in the way. Yeah. And then finally, let's do the last one here. Same, one step, minus two, yeah. minus two, minus one. All right, here again, here we go. It's gonna roll a zero and no. Okay. Oh, I rolled nine. So now so I think you, we're finally finished. Yeah. So again, you can teleport your leader. Um so, so he's now, yeah, go ahead. These guys could do something again, but it could only be move or they couldn't do the yeah. same. They can't fire again. Yeah. The rear guard and all that stuff. Okay. A rally or all righty then so i can teleport him yeah and you kind of you want to keep his range into consideration um you i mean a range of 10 so somewhere around pluma top here these kind of units you see up in the top left yeah uh, if you place him what can i if you place him sort of around these units here you can see where i place that column marker yeah that that would put him within range of those units on the beach and within range of units further south. Um, this is where you've got to kind of consider what units you want to have activations with, where your focus is going to be. Ooh, those guys are all out of range. The ones in the bottom right are, but the ones, the most important ones in the beach are in range, plus you've got your other units moving up in column in range. Yeah, I might be able to move them closer. Um, will they yeah. those guys be able to do anything if they're out of command? Or will uh, they still? They'll still no, not do, they won't do much. But keep in mind, these are independent units, and this is where your other leader, this guy over here, Camp Griff Appel, he'll be able to activate them with his Camp Griff and his formation activation. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, let's since we're learning here. So these red, his fellow red units, though they will. What are they going to be able to do? Oh, yeah, so Steve's just pointing out um, need to move the yellow leader since he's alone now. He just goes to the nearest um, nearest independent or yellow striped unit. I'm just trying to think. It probably, where was he? Yeah. So he, he just can't be alone in the hex. Um, Should he have moved with that unit? Um, no, because it was their first activation. Um, they, they didn't. If, they, if you don't spend a command point to move a unit, you can't move your leader um, with them. Okay. Mm. So, um, I, I think probably up here. Transfer him to a hex that contains a unit of his formation. 
Um, I don't, it doesn't have to be the closest unit. It can be any independent unit. So you can move him way up, way up to the top right if you want, the right-hand side. I don't know if it needs to be the closest. Um, yeah, he was like here. He was in, he was in this. Um, okay. These in contact uh, things, where do those go? Those goes with the leader or they stay with that yeah, unit? With your, yeah, with your comp group Rorsch leader. Yep. So grab them and drag them up to the top left with your red leader. So they'll always stay with him. Um, it just shows what artillery, basically, the artillery is radioing him and his formation. Oh, I guess that guy didn't do anything. What guy? What did, oh, he, do? what did he do? Did he fire? Oh, I don't know what he did. Well, um, I, don't think, I don't think he did anything. If you want to do something with him, go ahead. All right. Well, let's attack the... Ooh, baby. Now... Does he still get to roll for company bonus if he's out of command? Or would he still be he would still be in command? Technically. Yeah, before you move your leader, yep. Ooh. Whew, yeah. Come on, baby. Come on. Now don't roll. It's a cohesion hit. Okay, that's on this. Cohesion hit? Yep. So they're pretty vulnerable. These are yeah, mobile IT guns. They're armored at least, but yeah. That was a good roll. So I could move him now. As a second activation, yeah, you want to spend a command point. Keep in mind, this is a unit that is very vulnerable to opportunity fire. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, hmm. um, well, I mean there, he's not going to do any good down there, except for unless you think it's kind of like a keeping you busy. Yeah, yep. Keeping you honest. All right, we'll do that. We'll keep you. Khan is just to the south of this map. So if you leave that road open, I'm going to ignore the beach and just march to Khan. It's not the objective, but. Yeah, right. You're thinking bigger picture. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I'll lose the scenario, but. All right, I'm going to turn him off his command range. All right, now I think I'm actually done. So. Yeah. I want to save this file. Just I should have done that a few times since then. And uh, yeah, everybody can see my file structure and all that. Let me get that off there. I don't know what are we doing here. We are doing um, what's the name of the center? To the beach, to the to the sea. Sea. Um, uh, to the sea. Let's make some. Okay, um, I've, we've been going here for two and a half hours. I would like to stop the stream, but I, if you would mind staying on a couple more minutes, Nathan, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I'm going to make any comments here. Well, okay, so first of all, <laughs> I took it from 11 to three viewers. That's a mix of sign of an exciting video. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's cool. Um, hey, Gen Chaos 33, thanks a lot for uh, being on here and kind of keeping us honest and answering some questions and doing all that. I appreciate it. He knows you, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, love to get on with you and you know get your insights on the game as well. Maybe we can get you on a have a chat about the game or a scenario or something. Um, and all the other guys who watch, I almost said Nathan, you're actually on, but commenting, I appreciate that. Um, I'm just gonna scroll through here real quick. We had uh, lots of gin cast. So that's that's good. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my goodness. I'm going yeah, to have to go through and read all the stuff you talked about. Oh, Ardwell Slayer was on here. Um, yeah. We've encountered uh, roads, railroads, uh, ridges, those crests, um, different terrain types, the difference between column, not in column. It's a, it's a focused scenario, but it really covers a lot of those fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So Ardwell Slayer was on here at some point. Thanks a lot, man. That's another great channel. Keith Talbot, like I said, he works on some game gun barrel to my arch nemesis in the miniature world. So I'm going to ignore him. 
ASL in real time. Just kidding, Gun Barrel. Uh, Alias in real time. Go check out that channel. Of course, Nathan. Uh, Ardwell Flair. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so modeling for ranch. Okay, lots of good stuff. Outrod sucks, man. So anyway, so all um, we're gonna get off here and chat a little bit about the this next steps and all that. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll play some of the some future stuff offline, not streaming. Might go a little faster too. Um, uh, but Nathan, thanks a lot for coming on and uh, mm -hmm. teaching the uh, teaching the robe wearing guy how to play this GTS series a little bit. And uh, and I look forward to more videos from you. So everyone, definitely go subscribe to Nathan's channel. Good stuff. And let me end the broadcast here. And last time I ended this broadcast, it hung up on me. So Nathan, if it does that, I'll like buzz you on Facebook Messenger. Yeah.